go ahead and get started here tonight. I just want to say welcome to everyone for joining us for the Newport to Bermuda 2024. We're going to say part one webinar. So in this edition, we're going to re just review kind of the last race. We'll debrief the 2022 Newport to Bermuda race. We're going to talk about the changes to the scoring for 2023. So it's still using ORR, but there's going to be a different calculation used for the race. And then we're going to talk about how to build an inventory for your boat around both the race and the rule. And so tonight, I'm lucky enough to be joined by both Tim Dawson, who works in the North Sales Portsmouth loft, and Jack Orr, who is in our Connecticut loft. Guys, can you uh, say a little bit about yourself? Hello, how are we doing tonight? Uh, hi, I'm Tim Dawson. I've worked for North Sales for 20 years. I've done several Bermuda races and other offshore style races and um unfortunately our my boat got struck by lightning the about three days before last year's race so i didn't get to enjoy it so i'm looking forward to hear what austin learned in last year's race thanks tim and jack what about yourself yeah hi i'm i'm jack or i've been with north sales since uh 1988 so uh but i was on the west coast for a lot of years uh before i came back east about 20 years ago. So um, I've, I've only done a few Bermudas since then, but every single, you know, every single race, we've had a lot going on. So uh, uh, hopefully we'll have some new stuff today for everybody. Thanks, Jack. And and I'm uh, Austin. I work here in Annapolis for North Sales, and I have been working for North Sales, I guess, coming up on five years now. And I've done two of these races. So I did the 22 and the 18 so far, and both have been a blast. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, part one tonight, Tim's going to talk about the required sales that you have to have, so storm sales and that sort of stuff. Uh, later on, he's going to touch on the sales selections and some cool Grand Prix setups that maybe not all of us get to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And then finally, he'll help us with the final race prep I'm going to talk a little bit about the 22 race because I think I'm the only one of us three who did the the last edition, which was turned out to be a really unique year uh, in terms of the weather, which made it quite interesting. I'm sure some of us on this call were in that race as well and probably have some fun war stories to share. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the lessons that I at least learned on the boat that I was on and working with with the crew that did the race. And then Jack is going to touch on all of the ORR changes for this year and how that might affect the strategy that we would use when building an inventory for your boat uh, going forward for the 2024 edition. So to kick it off, Tim, can you talk to us a little bit about the sale requirements for the race this year? Happy to. So anytime I'm going to start a, uh, you know, go do an offshore race, especially one that I haven't seen before. Um, the most important thing is to figure out what rules you're sailing under and what are the, you know, requirements, what do you need to have, what are the limits of what you can have, um, and just figure out how you're going to piece together a sail inventory that's going to work throughout across, you know, the entire wind range of, of sails, <clears throat> excuse me, as, um, Austin will get into with the, you know, with sort of the weather and, and the scoring that Jack will talk about, you know, the, the, what we what we're finding out is that the you really just need to have a well-rounded inventory and your sales need to work together and cover cover the um the entire wind range of sales because you know the, the, it seems to me that the the Bermuda race is becoming a lot less traditional in terms of just a southwesterly crack jib reach which is you know kind of what people think about the boat but it seems like we haven't had one of those races in a little bit of time so the key documents that are everyone's going to have to um, deal with are, you know, first and foremost, the Bermuda Ace safety requirements. Those are sales that you have to bring on the boat. The inspector's going to look for them when he inspects you, um, and you can't do it without them. The ORR rule sets the limits of how many sales that you can bring with you. Um, and then the, the world sailing offshore rules, that kind of ties into the ORR rule, just in the definition of a heavy weather jib. Um, and then the notice of race really doesn't address the sales for most of the classes, but the Finisterre division definitely has some very specific sale limitations. Um, and so that's important and that's found in the notice of race. Awesome. And Tim, you want to talk a little bit about this photo really fast and hopefully all of our uh, 
all of our participants can enjoy this picture at some point this summer here. Yep. So that's that's one of my clients that successfully finished the race last year. Um, that's a Swan 82 called White Rhino. And coming into the finish line, we see St. David's Lighthouse there. And I think that's the finishing buoy in the in the picture as well. And you can you're pretty close to the dark and stormies if you've made it that far. Yeah. Yeah. That's always a fun time when you get to that point. So going forward, sail requirements, what, what do we have to have on our boat uh, if we're getting ready for this race? So these these are all the things defined in the in the you know the safety uh, regulations for the race itself. Um, first and foremost, every sail needs to have a reef and a real reef. Um, makes sense. I don't think I would want to go to Bermuda without a reef in my mainsail anyway. Um, but you, it's defined. You have to have one. Um, in most cases, you need to have a storm trysail as well. There's there are exceptions that let you not have a storm trysail. Um, as we can see down to the, you know, these are, these are all the, um, you know, the definitions of what storm sails are, um, down in red, you can see that you can, you can get away with not having a trisail if your mainsail can reef 50% of the luff length, um, for mono hulls. And it, I'm not sure how many multi hulls we have registered quite yet, but it's, it's 60% for multi hulls. So a little different rule between the, the, um, the mono hulls and the multi hulls. Um, I get this question a lot in terms of like, oh, why don't, you know, do I want to put a reef in that high up in the sail where you might not buy a sail with a third reef? Do you want to put one in? Do you want your sail to have that? Or is it easier to just have a trisail that you may or may not ever use, but it's another sail? Um, I could make an argument for either decision, depending. And I think a lot of the theme will come up in terms of what I'm talking about with sales throughout this presentation is all of these decisions are very, very boat specific um, in terms of just your hardware, the boat with the characteristics of how the boat sails. So there's no clear cut right answer for any of these decisions. It's really important to, you know, just look at your own boat and your own hardware and your crew, even in terms of how you're going to deal with these things. Um, and all of us here at North Sales are happy to help with those kinds of conversations. Um, it's just working out what's going to be the best system for you to get through the race. Um, and then lastly, everybody needs a storm jib, um, which is pretty straightforward. Um, and we can see there the boat to the left. That's a typical trisail and storm jib setup. Yeah, one question there, Tim, that I get a lot, and I was wondering what your opinion was on it, is the inner stay storm jib versus the like a luff tape storm jib versus you know some of these other storm jibs with like a, a zipper that zip on the outside of the head stay do you have any opinion there or is it the same sort of very very boat dependent um answer it's it's boat dependent and this is a little you know if there's a little bit of a gray area here where what's really going to work if you're in a storm and you're going to use that storm jib versus what's going to get the inspector to check the box to say you have one. Um, I would say that the inner jib storm jibs, if you're really going to sail with them, the, you know, the, the boat, you need to have the right hardware. You need to be able to get, then the biggest limitation that most boats will have is being able to get enough tension on the, on the inner stay that the storm jib, whether it's a furling sail or, you know, how, however you're going to handle that sail, can you get, can you get rid of the sag that it's intrinsically going to want to have? And most boats aren't going to really have a functioning inner stay unless there's a halyard lock and, you know, multiple purchase system to tension that. Um, but you can set it up like that and no, it won't work. And the, the um, inspector will still say you have a storm chip. So it's, 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 again, it's, it, there's not necessarily a right answer. Um, one thing that, as we get into more of the other sales and, and the number of sales you can carry and things like that, you can have a storm jib that does fit in that spot that you actually use as a jib Genoa staysail. And, and that sort of lets one less sail that you might have to have on the boat. But again, I think it's still very, very specific. And, you know, storm jibs are a harder thing, you know, boats that are rated with roller furlers that all of a sudden take, you know, you probably didn't intend to take the sail down in throughout the entire race. You might furl it and, put up a spinnaker, or put it away or whatever. So those are there. It's as much about boat handling and sail handling decisions for each boat as anything. Awesome. Thank you. 
Now, this is from the ORR rule. These are the maximum number of each type of sale that you can uh, can carry. This Anyone that's done the race before has seen this chart. This chart actually goes back to the IMS rule, if not before. Um, what you'll notice is there's a lot of sales here, and particularly about the, the big thing for the Hetzels is to decide whether your biggest Hetzel is a large Hetzel, which really the big difference is whether it's bigger than 110% LP or not, and or whether it's a small Hetzel. And that affects the number of sales. But as you can see, with if you have a boat with a 150% Genoa, you can have nine Hetzels. And it's kind of left over from a day where our sales were not nearly as good as we're able to make today. And sales had a much smaller wind range. So you don't have to take this many sales, but this is the most you can you can take. And I think, you know, especially the higher performance and the lighter boats get, sales are just adding weight. They're slowing you down. And if anyone's ready on day three in the Bermuda race, you know, it gets pretty messed up down below in most boats and more sales just makes the interior that much more difficult to deal with. Um, but this is just the, the the big limit that you can have. All of this information, I just kind of pasted a summary here. All this information is in the ORR rule itself. I think it starts on around page 36. Um, and then there's some difference here. Um, <clears throat> a couple of key points is We'll get into code zero sales in another slide, but whether the lard roach head sole, which are sometimes referred to tweeners, I feel like they've been around a long enough. I don't want to spend a ton of time on those because they've been around since the 2018 race. I think, you know, trying to not go over the same thing we've done for the last three years, but um, there's a minor difference between whether your code zero type sale fits into the large roach head sole box or whether it's a spinnaker. Um, so which one of the spots it takes up in this table. Um, you'll notice there's a little red star next to the heavy weather jib. That used, used to be a requirement for this for the Bermuda race, where in addition to the storm jibs, you needed to have a heavy weather jib, which most of us would just understand as a number four. Um, but for in the last few editions, that hasn't been required. And actually, that's across that's not just a Bermuda race thing that's kind of across the board in the safety um the safety regulations and I think you know it's sort of as we become more uh tuned into safety it's sort of counterintuitive that they don't make you carry it um I, th I think it's mostly because of uh so many boats with roller furlers that don't want to switch jibs that it's impractical that they would use it in the first place um so it just became an unneeded expense um as a requirement but there's plenty of times when a number four jib is something that you want to have. So I would not necessarily discount that sale, um, even though you don't need it. Yeah, um, and that's, this is this is only for the Bermuda race, Tim. It's not the U.S. Sa or uh, world sailing safety regs, right? Like if you're going to do another race, like maybe Marblehead to Halifax or something like that, you probably still have to have the four, right? I would yeah. say yes. I think yeah, it's or only. the Annapolis to Newport race. That those right. of us who did that last year, you would have to. And, have and those are both that. ORR races as well. It's just Bermuda that this is the case. Yeah. And then the last point on this particular slide is the Finisterre division um, has extra limitations, and that that division is getting more and more popular every year. I feel, um, and it's kind of meant to just you know keep things a little simpler you're allowed one asymmetric spinnaker it has to be tacked on the spinnaker on the center line you can't use any sort of spinnaker pole that you can square or anything like that it can go on a bowsprit if you have one but it has to stay on the center line of the boat um some of the one of the fun things we'll get into looking at later is all the kind of stasels that are becoming more and more prevalent um they kind of they definitely limit the way that you can fly a staysail in that it has to go on a real fixed stay um so it's it's a little different than than you know basically it's designed for more cutter type rigs in a traditional sense um no large road tedsel <clears throat> which is essentially you you don't take a code zero unless that's the only spinnaker that you would take is a code zero size but by being limited to nylon or polyester it's kind of too stretchy to be that so it's really meant to be kind of you know main jib spinnaker type of inventory um 
just to clean thing up a little bit. The whisker pole here is just a quick note that um, you can use a whisker pole on a jib. It has to be used to windward, you know, so if you were going wing on wing with a jib or a Genoa, um, that is what the whisker pole would be used for, And but you do need to declare it. Um, these are just kind of brief bullet points on the, you know, the big picture of these limits. Um, it's like I said, it's all more in the, in the documentation in the race. Awesome. So the last, the last few of these presentations we've done, whether live or, or in webinar format, we spent a lot of time talking about the large roach headsels or the tweeners just because they were a new thing. I don't want to spend a too, ton of time on this um, just because I feel like we've covered it a lot. But this is an interesting example of a boat that I sail on in just in terms of which what's the difference between whether a code zero that's a spinnaker or a code zero that's a large roach headsel and what does it mean? Um, the one to the left is sort of a traditional code zero like we've all used for years, which still measures as a spinnaker in the rule in terms of the number of sales that you have in that previous slide. Um, the one to the right is the 63% mid girth one. Um, and that's sort of, it's a rare example that these two sales are virtually identical in terms of left leech and foot measurements, but how much different they set up flying. Um, the advantage is large roach headsail is you know the narrow the narrower girth that we can use allows us to make the sail flatter the um the the wider the mid is the more depth you need to put in the sail to support itself so it doesn't just flap if anybody remembers the original code zeros that just the leeches flapped like crazy all the time um the large roach headsails really really help out with that and you can see especially in you know if you focus on sort of the back half the leech half of each one of those sails you can see how much flatter the the 63 percent version of the sail is compared to the 75 percent version and what that means is you can just sail higher it becomes less draggy inside of 40 degrees seems to be a pretty key number in our testing um and it just helps you stay a little higher in lighter air with the with the sail um before they introduced a large roach headsail into these rules, anything like that would have been treated rating wise like a like a headsail, and it would assume you were sailing upwind with that much sail area all the time. So it was really really punitive in the rating. But as the uh, rule makers have become a bit more practical, they've they've made the the rating change for that large roach headsail fair and to the point where. If you were starting from scratch without a code zero and you were going to do the Bermuda race, you would, I think you would order the 63% sale um, without question. The, some of these questions, again, back to the specific boat thing, not all the rules treat these sales the same way. So IRC, for example, is changing now, but up until it's been favoring 75%. Um, Sales. So, you know, other rules, other races you want to do, you know, this is, yeah, the Bermuda race is a big deal, but buying a sale for one race or is, you know, kind of disappointing when you can't use it for the rest of your season. So. Awesome. And, um, and if anyone has any questions, by the way, you can put them in the chat below. I forgot to mention that earlier, just so uh, we'll try and answer them as we go along if we can. And if not, we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. So that, 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 the point of this was really just to show, you know, because we had two nearly identical sails, just to really see how the shape difference manifests itself and, and you know, a flatter sail will be better at tighter angles is really the, the key point here. Um, now, which one is right for you? Um, the, the case where not having a large road tetzel really seems to make the most sense is if you have a masthead boat, you know, masthead headsels and masthead spinnakers. And, you know, boats like that tend to have overlapping Genoas that are near 150% or 140 or wherever you decide to put it. Um, so the when you have a masthead 150% Genoa, it's it's doing a lot of the job that you're looking for a large roach headsail to do, where it actually might fill out your sail chart better um, with a 75% deeper shaped sail, just because the, the Genoa itself can do that work for you. So moving on to a, a sale selection chart, Tim, what are we looking at here with this? Uh, is what a sample J120 sales selection chart? 
this is just a, a basic sale chart, which again, very specific to each boat that we can we can build with if we have enough information about the performance of the boat, which we can glean from your OR rating certificate if we don't have specific designer uh, VPP information. But the idea is, you know, that we have the true wind angle going down the left side, the true wind speed going along the top, and you you could potentially have to sail in every one of those zones. And what sail are you going to use to to fill all those spots? Or can I help you identify? It's important to do a sail chart like one of the first things you do based on the sails that you already have, or if you're starting from scratch, just building it in terms of how many sails you want to use. This is just a pre pretty um, very, very common example where you, you know, two overlapping Genoas in the case of a J120, the number three would be a, you know, typical blade jib. And then the number four would be the, the heavy weather jib that um, doesn't count as one of your headsails because it qualifies through the ORR rule as that heavy weather jib. So the, in terms of like how many sails you bring, that number four jib is essentially free. Um, and then there's some lines in there, how we build these sail charts. It's all based off the apparent wind speed and the apparent wind angle, which there's curved lines in there that you probably can't see great. Um, but those define the curves of each sail. No, you know, is going to be effective through a range of apparent wind angles and in terms of shape and structurally in terms of apparent wind speed. And this is the first thing you kind of start thinking about when you're putting all of your uh, your sale inventory together again, because having too many sales is nearly as bad as not having enough. Um, so this is just an example of that. A lot of people have probably seen these, this stuff, um, I think in part two, when you get Peter Eisler involved, he'll show you how this can go straight into expedition software or whatever you use for routing to help you decide the sales. And so what, what you really use these for is a building your inventory in the first place. Then once you're on the boat, you use it because within the crew, it helps you decide when you should be changing and minimizes the debate about it, about, oh, do you think we can carry it? Well, we, you know, we know the sale chart says this. And the the sale charts that we would provide off the bat are the best, you know, the best thing that we can give with the information that we get. But these things are always a work in progress. And if you're doing any pre-racing and testing the reaching crossovers, which is always the trickiest, um, because they're the most variable and they can vary with C state and everything else too. But taking notes of, oh, this sail was really effective and we couldn't use it higher than this angle and this much wind speed. These things are always a work in progress and they're always evolving. Oh. Awesome. Well, thank you for that, Tim. I think at this point I'll, I'll kind of go in into talking a bit about the previous uh, edition of the race. Um, I don't know how many of us that were on this call did the previous edition, but, uh, those of us that did, it was a, a pretty fast and, and wild and wet ride all the way to Bermuda. It was you know, one of the most fun times I've had on a boat. It was essentially three three days straight of of more or less kite running and, and some pretty fun kind of surfable waves and current and uh, just an overall was a sleigh ride no matter what boat you were on, even, even the boat I was on, which is kind of a you know, medium displacement sort of performance cruiser. We were still hitting the, uh, the mid teens to mid teens to upper, uh, or lower twenties and boat speed when you, you factor in the current. So the boats were moving, everyone got to Bermuda quickly, which meant the dark and stormies got there quicker. And, and it, it was a lot of fun. I won't go too much into what the normal historical weather is because that's when we'll bring in, uh, Peter and Chris to talk about that. Um, but I do have a little bit of data from the boat that I was on in the previous race. And I want to thank our navigator, Sloan Burns, for putting these two images together for me. Uh, he pulled the wind uh, data that we pulled off of our boat for the race. And you can see it was sort of a northwesterly uh, anywhere from in terms of velocity. It got light at the end, but we we saw all the way up into the uh, the mid 20s for for some of it. And it was a ton of fun. You can see the other big factor in this is obviously always the Gulf Stream when you go to Bermuda. And in this previous edition, there was what we would call a meander on the way to Bermuda. That was a, a really cool feature that the boats that did well seemed to all take advantage of where you could get this little boost out of the Gulf Stream on, on Port Jibe. And so 
sort of the lessons learned were even in a VMG running race, the, the current is still a massive factor. I think in talking to, you know, other boats that did the race, I'm sure Tim and Jack, some talking to some of your customers, what did, what did you see coming off of the boats? What was like the one sail that came in that was always broken off on all these boats? Everybody yeah, everyone was breaking their A2 or their, their running spinnaker. And that's a product of uh, the, the big sea state that all of the boats were seeing surfing down these waves, you know, maybe flogging the kite if they didn't have it trimmed in enough or the, the dreaded brooch that might happen. I know on my boat, I the division we were in, unfortunately, I was not allowed to steer, but I was I was doing a lot of trimming and it was a full-time job trying to keep the kite full for all the different drivers as we would go from sort of like nine knots and then you'd hit like a 15 or 16 knot surf. And and so the apparent wind on, on the boat changes quite a bit when that happens. And, and early on in the race, we, you know, we did quite a bit of broaching and, and wiping out. And then as you get in a groove with both the driver and the trimmers, you, you find different ways to, to keep the boat on its feet. And I think the, the main lesson that I kind of saw both on the tracker and on our boat were there were quite a few boats that got out ahead and you could tell they were pushing really, really hard with their big sails up um, and, and really, really putting their foot to the floor. But you could also see there was quite a bit of wiping out on their track. And then I think eventually the, those boats that pushed really hard from the get-go who might have broke their big A2s or, or fatigued from all of the, the broaching eventually kind of came back into touch. And I think the boats that sort of managed their sail plan and pushed to sort of 90, 95% of the boat, but then kept the boat under control actually ended up probably doing better than those teams that pushed as hard as they could right out of the gate. I think some, some things to remember that, you know, I, I didn't even think about quite at first, but I found really, really helpful for the, the amateur drivers that I saw were, you could reef going downwind. So you would get picked up by these big waves and go on these big surfs. And when you were had a full hoist main, a lot of drivers found it difficult to keep the boat underneath the kite. And so we put a reef in and it made the boat significantly easier to drive in the big waves just because you didn't have so much sail area up high trying to move the boat around. So we were playing a lot with one reef, even two reefs sometimes when it was getting into the upper 20s. Um, we were setting the trim up just a little bit on the conservative side. So if, you, if you're going from nine knots to 16 knots, if you have the kite eased as much as you can to try and get as deep as you can um, on your polar chart, when you go for a 16 knot surf, it's just going to collapse. So finding sort of that trim balance of, of allowing the boat to go through a full range of boat speeds without the kite collapsing was ended up being a lot faster. Now, one thing to consider for, for all of these boats is typically if you if you ask for an A2 or you, you're on a boat and you go to order an A2 and you're sailing, let's just say, on the Chesapeake Bay, the sail designer is going to more or less assume that you're sailing in a relatively flat sea state. The material is going to be, uh, you know, you might see 20 knots every once in a while with it, but it's going to be set up for that sort of zero to, to 15 knot range. Um, if you're looking at a sail for offshore, it would be designed a little bit differently, right, Jack? Like if you were, if I came to you and I said, hey, I have a, a J120 and I want to do the Bermuda race, but I'm, I want an A2 for this race and, and we think it's going to be pretty wavy. What would you do with that sail differently? Well, you'd, you'd reinforce the luff. You might put extra strips down the luff and the leech. Uh, you might make the patches a little bit bigger. Um, you might make sure also the the luff cord and the leech cord were a little thicker than normal. So you'd have to give up a little bit of weight um, just for durability, right? Mm -hmm. You might even make it out of a cloth that's maybe a more forgiving cloth instead of a, you know, a high, high performance cloth, depending on the boat. Yeah, I, I think that that, that kind of was what I saw in our boat as we had an A2 that was more of a flat water A2 that unfortunately didn't make it through the race. Um, but we had, luckily we had an offshore A4, uh, that was built a little bit heavier that did make it through the race. So, you know, something to think about if you have an A2 that's, you know, sort of in its last, on its last legs, you got to remember if you do, do get a VMG running race, uh, if that does happen for whatever reason, again, you're about to put, you know, sort of four or five seasons worth of time on a, on a spinnaker that, you know, again, a lot of people don't consider that time factor over a race of how much, how many hours you're putting on a kite in one race versus two seasons of around the buoys racing. So 
If you think you're on the last legs with your sale, maybe maybe something to consider at least bringing it in for a service and having it evaluated to see if it can if it can make it through an entire race um, on a VMG running setup. So just talking a little bit about the tracks that that did well. Um, on the left here, we had the winner of the this would be the St. David's Lighthouse uh, division, which was Stan Honey um, on a Cal 40. And he had a nice squared back symmetrical kite that he was able to pretty much, you can see how little distance or extra distance that he sailed on the way to Bermuda. He, you know, he came out of Newport, got a little bit to the east and then uh, took advantage of the meander and, and got below uh you know, sort of below the rum line and was able to, to point all the way at Bermuda. The track on Warrior One, which is a, a Pack 52, a little bit steeper of a polar curve so that they don't quite run straight downwind like a Cal 40. They had to sail a bit more distance, but also that you can see the theme, the theme there. They took advantage of the meander as best they could and, and then sailed their polars all the way to Bermuda. Um, so yeah, that the lessons learned, at least on our boat, was you know, going into this past race, we the boat that I was on, we had a pretty good idea of what we thought the weather was going to be. The previous edition that I did before that, that the historical weather played out sort of exactly how we thought it would. This time it was completely different. So you got to be ready for anything. Uh, when you're VMG running, if you were in that last race, find the high average speeds, not the all out speed. Um, and then one thing I noticed as well in talking to a lot of my clients who finished the race is the wear on not only your sails but halyards so if you're running all the way to bermuda or you're or you're reaching and you do do some broaching or wiping out the the halyards tend to slip if they're not on a lock and so you can get quite a bit more chafing than you would in a normal scenario so it's good to think about if you're preparing for a race like this and you think your halyard is is on your last legs or you, you struggle with chafe at the top of your mast it's a good idea to to get your halyards looked at or reinforced as well for the race the current still matters going through the Gulf Stream, no matter what wind I think we have, and then conservation of sails. If you're if it's day one and it's blowing twenty, and you know you're going to need your your biggest spinnaker later on, and you think you could maybe still sail ninety to ninety five percent of your polars with that smaller, more reinforced sail, maybe it's a good idea to to save that bigger sail for the end. Now, Jack, we obviously in the last race, we sailed still under the ORR rule, but it was more of a, a course specific rating rule previously. You want to talk a little bit about how they're going to score the race going forward? Yeah. So like essentially, it, I think part of what happened in the last race, it was a catalyst uh, for making this change. And essentially uh, in the past, um, the way that they, determine the scoring for the race was they essentially had a preset formula uh you know years ago it was a preset formula that had a certain amount of reaching a certain amount of running a certain amount of beating uh at you know and then they sort of figured out the wind ranges by uh when you know by having an implied wind at the end by the time everybody finished uh then they went to, they did this historical study, and I'm sure that uh, the weather guys will talk about this, Peter and uh, Chris later uh, in the next one. But, and we, we put, we touched on this last time in 2022 when we had our um, uh, seminars, but basically the next race, uh, the last race, 2022, they decided to go to a model of, they took historical averages and they actually ran routing and then decided what historically uh was the timing and what the angles were and so on and so that that's how they determined the formula for the race but it was predetermined uh uh on a formula somewhat as opposed to real time so this uh this visual here basically has a description right off of the Newport to Bermuda website and essentially it's a long-winded way of saying They've decided to go to real time sort of um, routing the boats, figuring out how, you know, based on the weather that's actually forecast for the race the day before the race. So they're going to run everybody's boat down the route, figure out how much time it's going to take them to get there. Then they're going to pick one boat out of each division. That'll be called the scratch boat and everybody will get rated related to that boat 
And when everybody finishes, they'll use that, um, those times, uh, because they have a time correction factor based on how they did this by, by running all of these ahead of time. Um, everybody's run through the same thing. So they'll all have the same wind angles and the same wind speeds. It'll just be a relative difference um, based on their, their um, finishing time. So this is called the forecast time correction factor. So the idea is it's going to be a little bit more fair because like the last race didn't fit into the historic norms, right? And so, or if you had a big uh, change in the breeze partway through the race, that should be somewhat predictable with our, with our current um, weather models. And, uh, you know, Expedition's a pretty good program to route things. So, and it's pretty accurate. So essentially they're, they're putting their eggs in the basket of saying, you know, technology is pretty good. And their rule is a rule that's based on, you know, a computer model predicting how fast you're going to get there. So essentially their, their, their idea is that it's actually a lot fairer because there's no predetermined formula that may be completely different from the actual race. Mm -hmm. So does that make going. sense to get too confused there? So yeah. anyway, this is straight off the website. Uh, somebody popped up with a question, what other events use this? No other events so far. This is the first time that this will be done. They, they did go back and look at the last race and use this concept to kind of verify that they thought they were in the right ballpark. And they were pretty happy that that uh, if they went back retroactively and, and tried it out, that it actually ended up pretty accurate. Um, but this is only a Bermuda race thing. This is the first time it's ever been done as far as I know. Um, anyway, so this is another thing. This is straight off the website. And this is off of the frequently asked questions uh, page. And it actually is a very good explanation. And essentially, uh, if you look at the, they, they picked three boats, Apple, Banana, and Clementine. Um, they ran the VPP and they determined that, you know, Apple will get there in 103 hours. Banana got there in 110 and Clementine would get there in 124. So theoretically, if they ran the race and all three of those boats finished with that time, they would be tied, right? Essentially, they, their ratings would equate out so that they were tied right at that point. But that's, you know, that's not going to happen, right? Because essentially, uh, people are going to sail the course faster or slower based on seamanship, how they sail the boat, what sails they select, how they play the current, and so on. And so there will be a difference in time. So what they did was they said, Apple, Banana, and Clementine, they picked Banana to be sort of the scratch boat with a rating of one. And uh, by using math, they determined that, you know, uh, Banana has a 1.068 time correction factor and Clementine has a 0.887, meaning that it's slower. So it's going to um, take less it's going to take more time, more time to get to the same destination, right? So anyway, yeah, probably in reality, the um, the scratch boat will be the fastest boat in the division. So each of the three divisions will have its own scratch boat, and uh, so then from there, they'll uh, the actual finish time will be. Uh, taken against the elapsed time it actually took to, or the elapsed time to, to the finish will be gone through the factor and then that'll determine who actually won. So like in this example, uh, Apple did finish uh, the fastest time, but with its handicap, it ended up actually third because it, it got corrected out to 128 hours and Clementine uh, would have won the race uh, because even though it took them 130 hours, they still sailed uh, relatively faster down the course. So anyway, that's that's the basic breakdown of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think the big thing here is, is that 
it is going to make life a little bit easier for everybody because you'll get this time correction factor the day of the race or the night before and you'll be able to tell pretty much you know by the amount of laps time that's gone on how you're doing in the race in your division and certainly by the time you get to the end you'll be able to much in a much easier fashion figure out where you are uh and you won't it won't be a big mystery until you see the leaderboard you'll actually kind of have a pretty good mm -hmm. uh, estimation so i guess the yeah. next question is how does this change your sale inventory? Because we're sale sail makers, we're going to talk about sailing sales, and so uh, essentially, um, does this change how you would change your sale inventory? No, not at all, right? Because a, you can't know the actual weather before the race, so you can't pre-pick your sales or pre-pick your sale configuration and sizes and so on uh, way ahead with any certainty. So your best bet is like Tim said earlier, you know, you want to fill that sale chart to the best of your ability to cover all the ranges in the most uh, efficient way. So yeah, you don't need to have every single sale because, you know, every boat, you don't want to have every sale because they might not all fit down below or, you know, you don't have the sale handling ability to change, you know, 15 sales. So, um, Still want to do the best you can do to cover all of the ranges with your boat as you have it. Um, and then at the end of the day, it doesn't matter, you know, a little bit about the sales. It does matter because you want to have all the tools. But on the other hand, seamanship and sailing the course, you know, your navigator and uh, the guys driving the boat and trimming the sails are really is going to determine how you win the race because, uh essentially everybody's going to be run through the same course with pretty much the same wind conditions. So there's not going to be any weird uh, oddball rating things that cause an issue. Yeah. And then Simon in the chat asked, uh, will the correction factor be published on the website? How do we get access to that the night before? I don't exactly know. I'm going to assume they'll probably send out a, an amendment to the, uh, or you'll send out an amendment through uh, the, the the website and then show all. They'll, prob they'll probably factors. email yeah. everybody, every boat. Yeah. yeah. So at the end of the day, hopefully that'll make things a little more fun and a little more transparent for everyone. But it just, you know, once again, stress is what, you know, the, the three of us would tell you is that, you know, trying to cover uh, the wind ranges on your boat the best way possible is still the best bet. Yeah. So throwing it back to Tim, now getting into the fun stuff. Um, what what are some trends on the Grand Prix side of things? I know personally myself, I'm not going on like a super Grand Prix boat again this time, but I'm always interested as a gearhead and in, in what the, the Grand Prix boats are doing. Do you want to talk a little bit about, about that for our gearheads out there and our, our guys who are interested in the the, the cool fast boats? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, everything, all, you know, the boats that us regular people sail, it all, you know, in the old days, everything used to triple trickle down from the America's Cup for inshore sailing and the Volvo Ocean Race for offshore sailing. Now that all those boats are flying, it's a little bit different. That doesn't really apply to any of us. Um, but the, so really the the kind of most Grand Prix level, highest level um, monohulls that we're kind of working with these you know, that are boats that are relatable to ours are the TP-52. There's a picture of one there to the to the left that happens to be a fast 40, which is a basically a small 40 foot version of a TP-52. And then still the the um, the Volvo 70s that are still left over. They're kind of the ones really pushing the envelopes, you know, because of budgets and the wanting to test. And, and you know, we want to learn everything we can from what they're doing. And, you know, there'll be There'll be plenty of people that'll come in our loft and I'm sure it happens to to both Austin and Jack is like, oh, what are the 52s or what are the Maxi 72s doing? You know, the Maxi 72 is kind of the closest thing to the older America's Cup boats that we grew up with, are, you know, are. Um, so what I've kind of seen in offshore racing that people are really spending a lot of time designing their boats and designing rigs around is really using more sails and what kind of triple or sales at one time um, and getting into the triple triple headed rig, for example, 
um, they're finding ways to make that more effective. Now, a lot of things that have that have let that happen is really the sales have just gotten better. The shapes are more stable. The the um, between the helix structured luff, and we can make the 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 leeches more open and straighter. And there's just more room for the sales to get together. Um, why do we why do we use sales in the first place? The staysails in the first place. The obvious ones to add sail area. You know, you're throwing, you know, on a TP-52, I don't know off the top of my head, but that's probably a 70 square meter sale, you know, and that's free area that you don't get charged for on your rating. Um, but the one you can see, what you can see, you know, so then the real intention of it in a practical aerodynamic sense is it's increasing the flow of the wind around the leeward side of the mainsail. And it's the relationship, how, you know, you need that Genoa staysail, which is the small one that you can see in each of those, those pictures, that sail needs to be pretty tight and close to the mainsail in order, in order to do that. What you can see in the picture to the left is how much space there is between that code zero. I believe both these are 75% mid girth, um, code zeros, not, but it's, you know, either way, whether it's, a uh, uh, 62, 63 or 75, it still all works the same they'll tend to fit in there better with the flatter sail. Um, but even just with the way that we design code zeros compared to the way we did 10 years ago, there's usually more room for it. Um, the one thing that's a little counterintuitive is, you know, a lot of these modern boats with non-overlapping jibs, they tend to get a lot of weather helm when you start easing the main and going jib reaching and easing the jib. So even so it could seem counterintuitive sometimes when you're tipped over, <clears throat> to put up more sail, the being able to put that sail area in front of the keel actually reduces the weather helm, which let, makes the boat balance better. You sail with less rudder angle and simply faster. So when you start reaching, you know, if this were a typical Bermuda race where it's a southwesterly and, and your crack sheets, you know, you, you'd want to put more sail area in the front of the boat. And actually you might consider reefing the mainsail to, to, reduce the you know the weather helm and make the boat balance better it's really all about balance as much as anything else and you can feel it when you steer a boat and when you're like oh you put up you know a tiny little general staysail like that and you're like wow the helm just got a lot a lot lighter and i use less rudder angle which is just less drag and uh going faster um some of the you know real high-end programs um are using dedicated i don't have a picture of that here can you go back to the last slide oh, yeah. first i'm not quite done there yeah. Um, some of the more modern boats are, you know, actually building very dedicated, um, big staysails, for example, that kind of go right behind the force stay. They set where you would set a, a normal, um, spinnaker staysail. Um, but don't forget you have a jib and in the picture to the right, which is the really thing is they just have their normal jib still up there inside of a code zero and outside of the Genoa staysail. Um, you just need to have enough room for the sails to work together and not stall each other. And every boat's going to behave a little different, but the, the point is to test it and try it. You can put them up and, and expedition really good at measuring, um, how you're going. Polar percentage is a really great tool to use that I'm sure Peter will get into more, but you can put up a sail for 10, 15 minutes. And is it better? Does it, is it faster? Does it feel better? You know, sometimes feeling better is slower, but, um, you know, the point is try it play around um some of the boat you know it doesn't work for every single boat one critical thing that um you'll see in both these pictures is the general staysail halyard is well down the mast um and uh, you know some smaller boats you get into um you know more more production cruiser racer 40 type size foot boats they they may not have that extra shiv in there and you may be flying those uh jibs jib general staysail like that off the the standard jib halyard so that you know, opportunities not there for you. So, you know, there's, they're installing a, a general dedicated general staysail hired. It's no small thing, but it does have um, big benefits to, to making all that work. But the key is to, is to just test it. Um, you can go to the next slide now. Yeah. So Tim, I guess the question probably everyone's thinking is, even though I don't have a TP 52 sitting outside my house, do, do staysails, do they work on, on all these boats? Like if you have the shiv and I have a, just a medium displacement 40 footer, could I make, you know, at the very least a double headed rig maybe work for me? Or if I somehow have the room, a, a triple headed rig? I think any boat should, any boat should have a general staysail. It tends to be 
the second most used for most offshore racing that I do, it seems to be the second most used sail on the boat besides the mainsail. It's basically up whenever you can have it up. And, and it really comes down to a helm balance. And if you have enough, you know, whether it can fit in there and not get too close to the other sails, but it's really a, a balance thing. And I think most people would agree that jibber chain can be some of the hardest driving and it's usually a balance problem with the bow. Um, in terms of the testing, these are two very, these pictures are two, two very different uh, Hobart races. The one to the left is probably going through the Bass Strait in about eight knots of wind, um, kind of lumpy. Um, there is a spinnaker up there. I don't know, it's hard to see in the white. But the, the point of this is we have, this was our A1, our kind of flattest nylon spinnaker that we use on the boat. And it was a wind speed that we probably wanted to use our bigger A2, but the sea state wasn't really good enough for it. That sail was kind of too big and too full and unstable and, and didn't feel good. But yet we felt like it was enough that we needed some more sail area than just the A1.5, which is what that spinnaker is called, um, could provide. So, you know, a lot of times we just would sail with one or the other of the staysails, the Genoa staysail, the small black one. And the spinnaker staysail, which is a you know a traditional running spinnaker staysail, and we just said, hey, what's we need some more power? Let's put them both up. Let's see what goes. And we actually found it to be quite effective in that specific um, condition. It doesn't work all the time, um, but in this case, that's the point. You know, try it. You can put them up, and you can measure it, and you can take them down. It's it's not up forever. Um, so they're not just for for reaching and the um the picture to the right is warrior one which is the bermuda race winner from last time in the hobart race i believe this was the last race but it's like this wind picture it is really windy in this picture and they're running um and they happen to have a flying uh jib top out on the on the sprit there which isn't really applicable to the orr rule that's the hobart races in irc but the the point i'm trying to make here is it's they still have their jib up you know, don't forget about the jib. You can use the jib as a staysail. And then their Genoa staysail is down there inside it. You can kind of see the bottom of the, the foot of it. So free race service, Tim and, Tim and Jack, let's say, you know, I, I've got my inventory ready to go. I don't, I don't need to purchase any new sales this year, which might be a bummer for us, but you know, it is, it is what it is, but I have all these sales and I want to make sure they're ready for the race. What, uh, what can these guys do to get their sales ready for the race and, and what services can we do and offer? The most, I, well, the, the point I think I would make here is start early. Um, I have a couple of customers that I have already started this process with that have brought their entire inventories into the loft sometimes you know if you buy a secondhand boat you comes with a pile of sales you may not even know what you have whether it's any good whether it's worth using you know in terms of building your inventory and filling out that sale chart you got to start with what you've got now and figure out how you're going to build it from there and um, june's going to come quite quickly um so it's good to start now as you know we're, our loft will be open till Christmas and then, you know, right after the first of the year, we'll be right back into this. And um, so start now because you may not even know you have, you, you just don't know what you're in for and it gets really busy in the spring and, and uh, give yourself time. Um, in terms of just inspecting the sales, being able to just define what they are. Um, because sometimes you don't even know just looking at a sail bag that has a random sail code on it. We all call sales different things slightly. So just, just being able to define what you have and what you need to go. Um, most sales shrink in some way. So if they have a, every sale needs to have a measurement um, certificate. Um, the biggest ones especially are worth remeasuring because they probably a little measure a little smaller than when they were brand new. And there's a little rating benefit there. Um, looking over all your, your hardware, you know, the, the furlings, you know, code zeros come with furlers and make sure they still work. And then, you know, then the other requirements that you need for the um, for the race itself, you know, jack lines for clipping in the number boards or for when you don't have any sales up and you still need to identify yourself and all those little things that soft goods that uh, a sale off can take care of for you. Awesome. Jack, did you have something you wanted to add? Well, yeah, I was just going to add on to the remeasuring thing. Like Tim's right, like every sale has to have, especially the biggest sales in the inventory have, for the rating, 
um, you know, you can get a little bit of relief uh, sometimes in your rating by the sale shrinking slightly. But something else, too, is in some cases, like especially with spinnakers, they shrink quite a bit. So sometimes you're going to find that the sale, you know, if it's a six or seven year old sale, maybe it's and it's done two Bermuda races already. The thing might have shrunken quite a bit more and maybe it's time to get a bigger one. <laughs> so it's definitely worth worth checking out. Awesome. And then for for the onboard sale repair kits, you know, I think most of these have gone away maybe from the traditional needle and thread kits right tim and jack it's more glues and and sandpaper and that sort of stuff it's a little bit different than it used to be no i think you still got to have those because you know corner attachments and slide attachments and so on it's mm -hmm. good to have be able to hand stitch it on um the other one that you know it's a really good thing to make sure you have is some kind of alcohol or something that's uh you can quickly dry a spot so that you can make a patch mm -hmm. you know like especially with spinnakers you know the things falling in the water it's all soaked if you have some uh, alcohol or something that's you know don't use something really strong like acetone you probably don't want to have that because that's not good for your sales if you have any kind of uh, you know sale with kevlar or or uh carbon in it the glues you don't want to put acetone on them so some kind of mild uh you know just isopropyl you know rubbing alcohol is great it dries things off it gets the salt off then you can mm -hmm. stick you know then you can stick your glue on but yeah definitely epoxies and glues uh probably one of the most popular things that we put in sale repair kits is all the different kinds of tape sticky tape Mm -hmm. and, you know, we have many is... different styles based you know based on what kind of sales you have and um you know for yeah. sure uh that one on the far left the white uh that's your your standard sticky back kind of roll that you know stick your whole spinnaker together if you have to you know so yeah i know the, sp the spinnaker tape was used uh used a lot on the last race for a lot of different boats a lot we saw a lot of fun and interesting and unique uh, onboard repairs from different clients after after the race, which is just cool to see that people were were actually one prepared enough to to bring a repair kit, and then two willing and able to to try it out and, and give it a rip give it a rip on the water. So that was awesome to see from from people. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and wrap things up here. I just want to do a little bit of a plug for the part two of this uh, historical weather uh, briefing, which will be mainly featuring Chris Bedford and Peter Eisler. I'll be on with those guys, kind of just leading them through their normal um, historical weather pitch for the Bermuda race. They're going to talk about expedition, um, using your polars to the, uh, the advantage, and then safety and kind of, you know, they've been around for lots and lots of years. I know, Tim, you use them for pretty much all your racing, right? I use them a lot. And, um... They're forecasting. I've used them a lot and I've done a lot of sailing with Peter as a navigator on boats I've raced with. And yeah, these, the, these guys are great. I wouldn't want to miss this one. Awesome. So there'll be an email that will get sent out um, from North sales about that one as well. And you'll sign up just the way you signed up for this one. It'll be January 25th, same time, 7 PM. Um, and then we'll go ahead and just say, if you guys have any questions, we can answer a few here shortly. And if you have any more pointed questions for any of us, our emails are right there as well. Um, so again, Tim's in Portsmouth, I'm in Annapolis, and Jack is in Connecticut. So if you're in those areas, those are probably the best, you're, whatever you're closest to is probably the best to reach out to. Um, so I'll give a minute. Um, do you guys have any questions you want to pop into the chat with? I saw Simon asked another one. He uh, asked, what wind range are you able to operate the triple headsail in? And Luckily, we got our buddy Brian on, Brian Janney, another experienced North salesman to, to answer him for us. So thank you for that, Brian. Yeah, this is being recorded, right? So you can always go back and review this at any time. Yeah. Give it another 30 seconds, and with that, we'll wrap up. I didn't see what um, Brian's answer was, but um, the one thing about all that is 
having a, you know the, the way that the the sales every boat's a little different right and what, what you find out when you start putting a bunch of sales up is you run out of winches real fast so the ability to where you're going to sheet them you know where you're going to lead them how do you you know boats with runners you always have the lured uh runner winch available if you have two main sheet winches you want to figure out a way to be able to jam one off to be able to put a sheet there you know so you, you know you being having the ability to handle these sales and actually effectively is, is an important part of the decision as well. But basically, as soon as you can get the jib sheeted out to the rail and let the Genoa staysail sheet where the jib would sheet upwind, then that's once you you're making room for it. It's yeah. is key. Yeah, it's always fun when you pop your head up on deck and you got to like dip, dive and duck your way through a bunch of sheets and lines bleeding every which way across the cockpit. Um well, I don't have any questions in the chat, so I think we're going to go ahead and end it right there. I want to say thank you to everyone for coming, and uh, we'll see you next time, hopefully on the 25th.